We first welcome you to Authentic Assessment Online Teaching and Learning, brought to you by Mr. Malavan and Serendip Training. And uh, I've been working with him for the past couple of weeks to get this up. And I think we have some good stuff for you. So just to quickly introduce myself, I started teaching, get ready to be scared for these dates, okay? I started teaching in 1986. And uh, then I got a master's degree in about 2003, uh, sorry, 1994. And I started college teaching. Uh, I taught English for a long time. And then in about 2005, I switched to become a kind of a teacher trainer. And I've been teaching people about online teaching and learning since then. And I'm currently at a very large college in the United Arab Emirates. I'm here based in Abu Dhabi. So I'll say uh, good morning. Uh, so yes, good morning to people here. Good afternoon, because I see we have a lot of people east of me and I think there's people west of me. So even I can say good evening and I, I would say good night, but I don't think anybody's going to sleep yet. But uh, I know that we're coming in from a lot of different uh, countries. So that's great. Now, I want to share with you what inspired me in the first place to be a teacher. Uh, I'm just going to show you a really short clip from a video and imagine me as a student in this scenario coming up. If it's going to work. All right, here we go. Act which anyone raised or lowered raised tariffs in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government. Did it work? Anyone? Anyone know the effects? It did not work, and the United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. Today, we have a similar debate over this. Anyone know what this is, class? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone seen this before? This is me. The Laffer Curve. Anyone know what this says? It says that at this point on the revenue curve, you will get exactly the same amount of revenue as at this point. This is very controversial. Does anyone know what Vice President Bush called this in 1980? Anyone? Yeah, so now if you heard 1980, you know how old this film is. It's quite old, but I was pretty much this age when this movie came out and I had really bad teachers like this. And I said, I'm gonna go into teaching so I don't have bad teachers like this. Then later on, I realized I also need to be a teacher trainer to make sure other people don't become bad teachers. So if, uh, if I sound like that guy going droning on and on today, don't fall asleep, just kind of raise your hand and say, can we move on or something like that? Okay, so because I'm not here to bore you to death. We've designed today's session to be very highly interactive. Uh, and so we really do want you to participate, ask questions. If you want to use the chat, it's okay, but we really refer, prefer that you turn on your video, open up your mic and uh, join the conversation as much as, we, as much as you can. We're going to try and keep it to an hour, but I have a feeling it might run over a little bit. So if you have other things you need to do after this, hopefully you can stick around until the end. Okay. All right, so the first question that teachers, administrators and everybody asks is, how do you know your students learn something? So I wanna see if one or two of you might answer this question or get some suggestions. Um, one way to know if they've learned things is can they feed it back to you in their own words or explain it to classmates using their own words. Okay, so hearing students actual uh, summary of answers, concepts, et cetera, that's one way. Is there another way? May I? Yeah, uh, I usually like I usually like to assess whether my student uh, actually gets something from my uh, my teaching is if they can make anything new out of it, like a product or something, at least a written product or something functional product. Okay, uh, so this answer you you ask your students to make things based on uh, what you taught them. Okay, how about one more person? Yes, like uh, now I'm talking. 
Okay, oh, sorry. sir, this is Mazar Hussain Abdul Ghani from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Yes. Um, I always uh, ask concept of questions to my students, whether to know that they have learned something or not. So in this way, I think you can engage them more and ask them whether they learned or not by asking concept of questions after uh, something you teach. Uh, okay, so you mean asking them like open-ended questions where there's not a fixed answer, but based on a concept they have and then listening to their words, something like that, you mean? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, great. All right, so uh, we have a lot of people today and I would love to hear from everybody, but I want to point you to a small flaw in this question. And I would rather say that this is maybe a better question to ask because we're talking about assessment today. How can you get direct evidence that students have learned something? So if you can think about that for a second and if I can get maybe two or three people to tell me some ways that you've been able to get direct evidence that they've learned. Now it's gonna be quiet. Uh, Dr. Larry, this is uh, Zainab from Dubai, and uh, I feel like um, getting direct evidence, uh, mostly, of course, with whatever formative assessments that we would be doing, assessment for learning within classrooms, I think that sort of gives us the direct evidence of, you know, what level a certain student has reached at. And um, I think another way that I would actually get some evidence is... Um, you know, when they apply it, uh, when they apply whatever they've learned to uh, probably a situation or, you know, they, they, they try and make connections. So I think that is also good evidence of what they have learned. Okay. Uh, so you use the phrase assessment, uh, assessment for learning. And there's two other concepts, assessment of learning and assessment, by, uh, I think it's by learning. Uh, and these three concepts kind of go together. And this is something I would like to talk about. I'm not gonna talk about those today, but that's a good distinction that people need to know. We'll talk about that later. You also use the word apply, and I'm going to talk about that word very shortly. So thanks for bringing that up. Can I hear from maybe one more person? I see Mazur, you've raised your hand. So, or Madi Mansur, either one of you. Good morning, Doc. Good morning, everyone. This is Matty from Lebanon. I'm sorry for not turning my cam on. I have personal reasons. Um, <laughs> concerning the, the word evidence, it's uh, best when supported by numbers. So um, if, if we're talking about knowledge transition, then the best way we, we ask uh, applying some knowledge in different contexts, and we're talking about uh, knowledge retention, then I do some, some kind of multiple choice questions okay. so that I can quantify that the learning. Good, I'm glad to hear that phrase, multiple choice questions. Somehow I knew that was gonna come up today. I'm not sure how I knew that, but okay. <laughs> and I am going to talk about that later today. Let me take, uh, there were two or three other raising hands. So let me just take one more. Janty, person. go ahead. Janty, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, thank you, doctor. I'm Jamie here from Saudi Arabia. And uh, regarding this question, uh, direct evidence that students have learned something. Uh, as a teacher, uh, I would expect the students, uh, you know, uh, to explain uh, in their own words what they have uh, learned. And also, I would uh, expect them to, uh, I mean, discuss such questions with their uh, peer group and come up with their own ideas and how they apply uh, uh, to the conceptual learning. So uh, it's like when I um, get uh, uh, get them speak, I understand that, it, I mean, the students have got what I've taught and it has reached them. Okay, so you, uh, you have them work in groups and you have them produce unique answers and it sounds like Again, you use conceptual or open-ended questions, but the main point is to get them to produce unique answers that you can then evaluate right there formatively 
uh, to that's, see. That's how yes, that's how I get to know that uh, they have understood what uh, I mean, what we have taught them. Okay, great. All right. So again, you've used a lot of words and concepts that I am going to talk about today, and uh, I hope I'm going to get some new things for some of you. And for those who don't know what we're talking about, I hope we're going to get uh, some basics, basic definitions going on in here so we know what's happening. So let me move on and talk about authentic assessment. This is our main topic for today. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm going to go very briefly over three types of assessment. And all of these are, uh, we're going to offer as online workshops so we can uh, dig a little deeper into these concepts and actually do some practice. Today is more like um, a sample plate of what's out there. You know, a sampler, if you order a restaurant they bring you lots of little things. I like to talk about food all the time. I apologize for that, but I like to eat. I think we all do. But think of this as a sampler plate. And if you really like something, then uh, we'll probably have a workshop for you. And we're gonna ask you about that uh, at the end of today. So the three types of assessment we're gonna talk about are task assessment, and this, uh, I'll get into that, but uh, again, someone mentioned multiple choice questions. That's probably the most popular and famous and et cetera, et cetera, about um, the type of assessment. But then I also want to give you a very brief overview of rubric-based assessment. And then I'm gonna talk about portfolio assessment. And I have little samples of all of these and a couple of stories to tell through all of these. So let me just go through this. And again, if you start hearing anyone, anyone, and you start falling asleep, just let me know, okay? But I'm trying to keep it so that that doesn't happen. So everything we do at the college I'm working at right now is based on Bloom's Revised Taxonomy. Bloom's Revised Taxonomy. This is the 2001 version. Now, what you're looking at on the screen is something we call the pale, but if you know Bloom's, most of you probably know Bloom's as that pyramid triangle-shaped thing. But in 2001, Anderson and Crathwell, when they redid the taxonomy, they also presented this image, and I'll talk about it. But for those who don't know Bloom's taxonomy, here's a really brief description. First of all, this is the cognitive domain of the taxonomy. There were actually three domains they wrote about, but educators tend to focus on this one, what the brain does and how the brain thinks. So we start out with the lower order thinking skills. And these are usually classified as remembering and understanding. And remembering is the simple recall of facts, the regurgitation of what you've learned, repeating what you've said so that you know that thing. And understanding is related to remembering because that's, that moves up slightly of connecting all of these facts together and seeing what those relationships are. And I'll tell you right now, as a student, most of you, and this includes me, uh, and I'm from the US, by the way, born and raised in Chicago. Um, and most of us in our schooling had the type of teacher that you saw that did a lot of this. They threw a lot of facts at us and asked if we could remember or understand those facts. They did a lot of lower order thinking assessment. Uh, but then the mid-level of blooms, which is kind of the, the bridge between lower order thinking skills and higher order thinking skills is called applying. And remember, one of you uh, gave me this answer how you need students to apply what they learn to something. And applying, I like to say, is kind of like problem solving at either its most basic or more complex or more higher order. So applying is the bridge. And then the three higher order skills, analyzing, evaluating, creating, in the old pyramid, uh, evaluating was actually at the top, but in the revised taxonomy period, creating, uh, pyramid creating is at the top. Where I work, we decided to use this model, this representation, because these higher skills are kind of equivalent to each other. They happen back and forth. But the main idea is that this is, different ways that the brain uses in order to process information to apply it to solving some kind of problems. More importantly is this arrow on the left, this up-down arrow. And you want to think of 
uh, thinking skills more as a continuum. Uh, as you can see in the pale, there's lines between each of these levels, but we don't really have the lines when we think. We kind of move up and down. Uh, we kind of start somewhere and we might move up or we move down on this continuum. So every kind of assessment that you do that you wanna think about should be somewhere on this continuum. And um, especially when you're doing assessments, whether it's simple multiple choice questions or moving up into performance assessment with rubrics, which I'll talk about, you always want to keep in mind more than anything else, what is it I want my students to be doing with their brains and how am I going to get direct evidence of that from their brains? So everything is based on moves. But let's start with a question that most administrators ask. And the question is, what's the most efficient way to gather this direct evidence of learning? Uh, and I'm sure you have a pretty good answer, but this is where we can get into task assessment and thinking about task assessment. And there's a big problem with multiple choice questions that I wanna talk a lot about. And I think in, in my opinion, and basically how it needs to be is we want to design testing and test questions to assess the ability to apply knowledge and or skill or competence or all three or any combination to real world scenarios. And if we can do this and we can in most cases then we need to do this because this is going to help us get this idea of direct evidence. So I like to distinguish uh, between traditional assessment and authentic assessment. So I have about three or four things that you wanna keep in mind. First of all, traditional assessment tends to be teacher structured. And, and I'm gonna beat up on multiple choice questions here a lot. So I, I'm, I'm actually, I'm not going to apologize. I like beating up on uh, multiple choice questions. Uh, so what we really want in authentic assessment is learner structured evidence. And uh, several of you have already mentioned how you try to get students to produce this in a variety of ways. So that's good. You're ahead of the game by doing that. We tend in traditional assessment to have students select a response. It could be a multiple choice question. It can be a true false question. It can be a matching question. It can be a fill in the blank question. Uh, so we do that a lot, but what we really need to focus on to get authentic assessment is to get our students to perform some kind of a task and especially a thinking, a higher order task where they have to apply their knowledge or they have to analyze something or evaluate something or create something new. Uh, traditional questions also tend to be contrived. Uh, you have to think of a lot of things. I'm thinking of math problems that I used to do back in high school where this train was moving in this direction and this was moving in this direction and calculate how much time it was going to take for the two trains to meet. And I thought, you know, I'm never going to be a train schedule person. That seems a little artificial and contrived. So you want to devise ways to connect their learning to real life situations and give them real life problems to solve uh, problems to solve that will happen in their real life. So traditional instruction, traditional assessment usually is about recall of information or recognizing relationships when again, you want them to construct new things or to apply what they've learned. And the ultimate thing about traditional assessment is you can never really get direct evidence. You get indirect evidence, uh, but authentic assessment will definitely get you that direct evidence you need so that students know what's going on. Okay, so now it's game time. Do you know this game? Have you ever seen this game show? Can anybody tell me the name? You can open up your mic. Who wants to be my millionaires? Who wants to be a millionaire? Okay, hopefully, uh, I don't know, have you played this game before, anybody? Have you been an actual contestant and won $1 million? Sorry? 
Okay, you've seen it on TV. Okay, well, we're going to play the game. We're going to play the million dollar question. So imagine uh, if, if you know, for those who don't know this game, a contestant like this gentleman sits down and he's asked a series of 10 questions. The first question's really easy. And then the next question gets a little more difficult, then more difficult, more difficult, all the way up until question number 10, which is the most difficult question. And if he can answer it, he can win $1 million. Okay, now there, uh, I've seen that there's 100 people today, so I cannot offer you a $1 million because if 20 of you get this right, I don't have $20 million to give you. So I apologize for that. But imagine you're about to get the $1 million question. Ready? So on the next screen, I'm going to give you the $1 million question coming up. Here we go. Oh, sorry, my screen is a little uh, uh, obscured. Uh, what is, <laughs> I covered up my question, so I can't see it. Can somebody read this, the question for me? Sure, may I read it? What is the name of Chicago baseball team that is less favored of the two teams? A, Bears, B, Bulls, C, Cubs, D, White Sox. Okay, so in the chat for $1 million, type your answer. Let's see how we do. Uh, I don't have my chat open either. Let's see if we can get. We have A, Bears, B, okay. B, White Sox, Bears, okay. It looks like everybody has guessed at least one time. All right, so it looks like so far there's only three millionaires out there. Uh, all right, so what's, What's the point of this question? The point of this question is if you're from, if you're American like me, you probably got the answer right. If you're American and a base and a fan of American baseball, you probably got it right. If you're not American and you've never heard of the sport of baseball, you probably either guessed right or you got it wrong. Okay, so this is definitely a biased question. Absolutely, this, uh, so any American who answers this, can anyone from Chicago will automatically get this. It's a very easy question for them. But if you are from uh, Lebanon or Turkey or Indonesia or Saudi Arabia, you're probably not a fan of American baseball and you have no idea what the answer is. So first I'll give you the answer, which is, Sorry, I'm only on one screen. The answer is the, the White Sox. Okay, well, that doesn't tell you much except that there's a Chicago team called the White Sox and they're not as popular as the other Chicago team, which is the Cubs. By the way, are there any Cubs fans out there? If you are a fan of the Chicago Cubs, I would like to ask you to please leave this session immediately. I don't like talking to Cubs fans. Okay, yes, I'm joking. Okay, so my point of this question is very, I have a very simple point. And the point is cognitive complexity does not equal difficulty. For you non-Americans out there and for you non-baseball fans out there, this is a very difficult question to answer. If you've never heard of this information before, you can't recall it, right? But if you think of Bloom's taxonomy and cognitive complexity, this question, like every question on who wants to be a millionaire is simply asking your brain to recall information if you've heard the information before. So even though it's a difficult question in terms of the type of information it asks, depending on where you're from, we all share the same level of cognitive complexity in trying to ask this question. Have I heard this piece of information before? And if so, can I recall it and remember it? And I guarantee you most of the multiple choice questions you have been asked in your education, no matter what country you're in, and possibly most of the multiple choice questions you design for your students are these types of recall of information questions. They're usually lower order thinking questions. 
And uh, part of the online workshop that we're going to do with you, not today, but later on, uh, I'm going to uh, help you to write multiple choice questions at a higher level. And hopefully that'll be interesting to do. Oh, now I wanna, uh, and again, I said I was gonna beat up on multiple choice questions. Um, I learned the secret to taking multiple choice tests in three steps. Is there anyone out there who can explain the three steps to taking a multiple choice test and scoring very high? May I? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So if you want to score high on the multiple choice, what I advise my students is that they should uh, follow the elimination process, right? So say for example, if there are four, four options provided, right? Two options you can directly eliminate based on your knowledge and understanding of the concept, right? That leaves you with two options which would be very close. So there your knowledge will come into play. Yeah, you need to know thoroughly as to what the question is asking you to do, right? So that that will uh, totally be based on your understanding and then you will be able to answer the question accordingly so that's what that is the advice that normally i give to my students um, okay yes that's yeah. perfect that's step number two okay at three maybe that's a that's a dicey one how to exactly uh, uh, get the right answer uh, that is uh, on your totally on your knowledge part. So how thoroughly you have read the concept that will help you to eliminate that third option probably. Okay. Or I would like to know from you the third step rather. That's, that, that's still step number two. All right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. the, the yeah. three steps. When I, when I applied to do my doctorate, which is in educational leadership, by the way, uh, I had to take a multiple choice test called Miller's Analogy. And it was a 120 question multiple choice test. And I think I had 60 minutes to answer 120 multiple choice questions. So here's what I did. Okay, step number one, and sorry, my screen is still obscure. Uh, I answered all the questions that I was absolutely sure of. And if I had any doubt at all, I would skip that question because on the Miller's analogy test, you are not penalized for wrong answers. So I knew, first of all, I should answer every question that I could. So first I answered the questions that I was sure. Of. Then I went back to the beginning and I looked for all the unanswered ones. And I tried, as you said, to use my knowledge to try to eliminate what I knew were the wrong answers. And then I would guess from what I could. Most, most multiple choice questions have four options, right? Four possible answers. And if I can at least eliminate one, that gives me a 75 chance, 75% uh, what a uh, one in three chance, 25% chance of getting it correct. And if I can eliminate two, that's a 50% chance. So the second pass, I would do the best I could by guessing through elimination. And then step three, because I know I wasn't penalized for wrong answers, all of the other questions where I didn't know the answer, I would simply choose C because I knew because of the randomness of the answers, uh, at least 25% of those pure 100% guesses would be correct. And oh, I thought that was, sorry to interrupt. I thought that was not the right thing, but students normally say that if you do not know the answer, choose C. So that is really the case. That's great to know. It can, it can be C, it can be B, it can be yeah. A. But the thing Probability. is, if you have no idea, always guess the same. Don't randomly guess. Okay. Always guess A because you're going to get at least 25% of those right. Maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. But if you aren't penalized, then why not just guess? But log uh, logically, you just stick with the one way to do things. Oh, great, thank you. So um, really what this points out is there are a lot of flaws in multiple choice tests. And again, in the workshop that I will do with you on writing higher order multiple choice questions, you at least can move away from that. But I would say with authentic assessment, we know that selected response questions like multiple choice never can give us absolutely direct evidence of learning. 
And we want direct evidence of learning from our students because we don't want our students to be like this. Okay, we want our students to have experience with real world skills. Uh, and we need to do set up activities and evaluate them in different ways. Okay. And uh, Kaige, I did read what you read and part of the workshop, we, will, we'll, we can talk about this a little more deeply, but I'm going to move on now to our next question. And which is how do you communicate your expectations of higher order thinking projects? with your students. And I'll be happy to take an answer or two here. Uh, yeah, somebody wrote rubrics. So I'll just go right in. So rubric assessment is, is usually the way we communicate what we expect from students. So let me talk about rubric assessment. Uh, first, I might ask, have any of you used rubrics? And I'm thinking the answer is probably yes. Can I maybe get one example of a, how you've used rubrics with your students? On the writing exams our students take at the university for English, um, it's all rubric-based grading. Okay. And their daily assignments, or their writing assignments are rubric-based. Okay, and uh, I know uh, I come from an English language teacher background and we know that writing is what's called a productive skill. So when you're asking students to produce something original, that's obviously very authentic. So it's good to communicate your expectations of what they need to think about when they're producing something. This is where rubrics come in. And we have people typing in the chat, lots of things. And uh, the person who typed holistic versus analytical, this is what I'm going to talk about very, uh, very quickly here. Okay, and again, you're welcome to open your mics and contribute. So uh, rubrics are usually scoring scales used to assess learner per, uh, production or performance. Sorry, I really need to fix my screen. Give me just a second because I have some things in the way. It's hard for me to see what people are writing. I'm trying to keep my chat open too, but it's blocking a lot of what I'm saying. Okay, uh, so it's used to assess production and, or performance. And again, I won't go into details about what that means, but again, if they're writing an essay, uh, I'll just, a couple of examples I can think of is if you're having them do a project, project-based learning usually is assessed by a rubric and any kind of performance, any kind of writing, anything they create, which is uh, that higher order thinking level in Bloom's taxonomy, can and should be assessed with a rubric, although I do have some counter arguments to that, which I could present in the workshop that we'll do on rubric writing. Uh, and the, there are actually several different types of rubrics, but the most common rubrics are two types. And these two types answer these two questions. The first type of rubric asks, how well are my learners doing? with X, Y, and Z, with three different things. Uh, or you can just say, how well are they doing overall? And um, this first one, this first question, somebody, uh, can you tell me the name of this type of rubric? The question for how well are my learners doing with X, Y, and Z? What type of rubric is this? That should be analytical. Okay, and this is the second one. one. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the second one is holistic. The first one, analytical. Right. So we have analytical and holistic rubrics. There is another one that I'm not talking about today called, um, oh, senior moment called, um, okay, my brain stopped. That happens from time to time. Uh, I have the term coming up later, sorry. So uh, I'm going to talk mainly very quickly about 
analytic and holistic. And I'm just going to show you uh, a couple of examples of what these look like. So uh, you uh, hopefully one day in the future, uh, I also do coaching, I do consulting, and you might call me and say, Larry, I'm teaching online. I would like you to come and watch me teach online. And I would like you to help me look at how I question my students and how much time I talk versus how much time they talk. And I want you to listen carefully to the examples I give to them and tell me how I'm doing with that and how well I organize my activities. Uh, and then uh, I would also like you to tell me whether I do this at a novice level or an apprentice practitioner level or an expert level. So what you've asked me first is uh, a set of criteria, which we'll call the descriptors. And this would be questioning, talk time, examples, and activity. These are the things I would be looking for in terms of your performance as an online teacher. And then I would give you a novice apprentice uh, practitioner, an expert. This is what we would call the range of performance. And very quickly, th these labels can be different. The, the criteria that you're looking at can be different. And usually rubrics, analytic rubrics are set out in this grid system. And usually people fill in every single box. But rubrics are actually much more than this and they have much more flexibility. But this is definitely um, the typical analytic rubric that you might see and maybe you've worked with in the past. And in the workshop that I would do with you, I would talk a lot about this. We use rubrics uh, in a lot of ways, even with the teachers we're training. My main job at the college I work at right now is a professional development specialist. And so we use a lot of performance type rubrics. We observe the teachers and then we use this rubric and we give them formative verbal feedback. And then we also follow up with some formative written feedback. Uh, so you can use this basic rubric for a lot of things, but if you're looking especially to get direct evidence from your students uh, based on higher order thinking skills, you'll want to think about having them performing or creating something along a set of criteria that you give to them so they know how to prepare and then you can score them on that. Uh, I, I have an example that I'm that I will show you in the online workshop that we that I actually use with the teachers I work with at the college I'm at. And the college I'm at, we have 1,200 teachers, so I have to do a lot of rubric marking. So I've created a really simple rubric, and and I can give you some more details about that during the the workshop coming up. But this is your basic of an analytic rubric. Uh, now. A lot of what I wanted to talk about today was teaching and learning as an online teacher. So I would like you, if you can, hear in the chat, because we want to check out your names. Here's four statements. And I would like you to assess yourself right now, if you can, just by typing in the word novice, apprentice, practitioner, or expert in the chat. So how are you as an online instructor? How are you doing? Are you a novice? Are you just starting to learn to teach online and you really don't understand it yet? Are you an apprentice starting to get it but still need someone to coach you through it? And again, I do coaching, so I'm happy to coach you through being an online teacher. Uh, I'm a practitioner. I can mostly do it myself, but I sometimes make mistakes or get stuck on things. Or I'm an expert, I understand it well, and I can thoroughly teach it to someone else. So if you can, please, again, just type novice, apprentice, practitioner, or expert. Uh, okay, and while you're typing your responses, obviously, this is what I would call a holistic rubric. This is a series of statements bundled together. So I am a novice is the first statement. The second statement is actually in two parts. I'm just starting to learn this and I don't really understand it yet. So this is actually three statements bundled together as one. Um, and during the rubric workshop, I can talk about advantages and disadvantages of using this type of rubric, whether it's to assess yourself or assess other people, because maybe, uh, you read the statement and you said, well, I am starting to get it, 
I don't really need a coach, but sometimes I do make mistakes. So I'm kind of in the middle of apprentice practitioner. So now you've taken one piece from one of the statements and one from the other, and it doesn't exactly fit. So this is a little bit of a weakness of a holistic rubric as opposed to an analytic rubric. But the idea here is that uh, if you're wanting to assess what's going on, you'll want to be able to uh, do this in one go instead of breaking things out in an analytic rubric and marking many times. It, it depends on the number of students you have, et cetera. Okay, let's move on and uh, we're moving into the third part. How do you help your students see direct evidence of what they learned over a longer period of time? And I would like to hear one or two people maybe supply an answer for this question. Anyone brave out there? Larry, you didn't mention the million dollars before the question. You, know, you should have. Uh, but this isn't a multiple choice question. No million dollars for you. <laughs> okay, so the non-response tells me either number one, you're very shy and you don't want to answer. Number two, you prefer never to participate in anything, which is fine. We know we have a lot of students like that, but they, they're still paying attention. Or number three, you've never thought of this question before. And uh, of course, this question is the basis for portfolio assessment, which is our third type of authentic assessment that we're going to talk about today. Have you used, so um, the question out to all of you is, have you used portfolio assessment before? And if so, can you give a quick example of how you've used it? We've, um, when I was doing more K-12 education, in English classes, I would have kids build a portfolio, uh, especially of their writing. So they would, we do exercises where they would learn about the type of writing we needed to do, build the grammar that they needed for it. Um, and they would keep all of these together and work towards a final essay that they created. And they could see the process then of going from beginning to end in writing because the writing also would include brainstorming, drafting, revising, editing, all of the different steps. And so they built from step one to final step and then they would build, keep all of their essays then bundled so that they could see all of the different types of writing they were learning. Okay, that is a perfect example of one of the three types of portfolio I'm about to describe. Can someone else give me a way they've used portfolios in a different way? Um, yes. Hola, uh, Sorry. Um, I can talk about teacher training where teachers have to prepare lessons that are assessed by their um, planning and then observed and they get feedback on that and they get uh, sort of a, um, report on how they are progressing at different stages of their teaching practice and what they need to do to complete the course. Um, Great. And then they get it all compiled together at the end and, and signed off to see what Great. they have accomplished. That's a perfect example of another portfolio that I will talk about. How about the third type? Does anyone want to try to give me an example of the third type? Yeah, Felicia, I see your hand is raised. Felicia, uh, I had my hand raised for the other type that I think uh, Diane mentioned. Oh. Um, and we did it digitally. So uh, during one of my humanities classes, the students were um, given the task to create a website using Google Sites um, of the concepts that we learned about sustainability and um, technology. We had two units and they were supposed to use um, 
the, uh, create a website to display their knowledge about those concepts. And it was over the course of the semester. So it was their final project for the semester and it was cross-curricular with their um, uh, IT class that they were taking. Okay, so what was in the portfolio exactly? So it was a website that they were supposed to create about the topics that we learned in, in humanities. So we learned about um, sea levels rising, we learned about deforestation, um, we learned about the general topic of sustainability and how it includes <coughs> recycling, um, hydroponics and aquaponics, okay. these topics. So they were supposed to um, put together a website to display their knowledge about those specific topics that we covered over the entire okay. semester. So for example, they might have had one page for each of those topics that they worked on and they revised and you evaluated Correct. them and then they changed it to make it the best possible thing that it could be. Correct. Correct. Okay. That's our third type. Perfect. And um, I don't uh, mention, I am going to talk about some online uh, technology that you can use for all of these things. That's my last slide. Um, and I did not mention Google Sites. You said Google Sites, right? Yes, Google Sites. Okay, so I it's don't really use it friendly for the students, especially if they have sure. that domain. It's basically sure. point and click and everything yeah. is explainable. There are pluses and minuses to Google Sites. Uh, a lot of public places don't want things out on the web for anyone to see. And I will talk about that again in my last slide. But uh, your examples have covered all three of the types of portfolio. So let me just talk about these for a second. Uh, the first type, which I think Diane mentioned, is what I call a growth portfolio, where you and again, she said that her students do some writing and drafting and all of that goes into the portfolio. And over time, they can see how they've learned all these concepts, practice them, and they have, uh, they're able to look at the entire progress of their ability to write better. So that's what we call a growth portfolio. And I'm going to give you a different example in just a second. And uh, Felicia then talked about what I would call a showcase or product type portfolio. And this is where you take the best work done during a term and you display it out there in a portfolio for people to see. And uh, I'm sorry, I uh, missed your name of the third person who said that teachers write up lesson plans and uh, those build up over time. And then it's decided if those plans are good, they can move on. And this is kind of an evaluation type of portfolio or what you might call diagnostic. By, by the way, diagnostic was the other kind of rubric that my old brain couldn't think of at the time. So I didn't talk about diagnostic rubrics today and I might, during a workshop, I might touch on those a little bit. But during the portfolio workshop, we'll go into all three of these types and share ideas and even try to create a basic outline of what might go into a growth portfolio or what might go into a showcase or what might go into evaluation. And all of these three types of portfolios depend on a series of questions that you need to ask. And I'm not gonna read these questions, I'm not gonna go over these questions, but I am going to be quiet for about five, for 10 seconds, so you can read all of these questions, okay? Okay, I'm thinking that's about 15 seconds. So. In order for you to decide what type of portfolio you're going to use to get direct evidence of student learning, you need to think carefully about all of these questions. And again, in the online webinar, uh, we will go through this and this whole process of selecting the proper type of portfolio, and then we'll do some experimentation with outlining some of the items we might include depending on the type of portfolio that we're looking at. 
Okay, so uh, I'm just going to give you another example of a growth portfolio that I did way back in uh, the ancient times. And I used this thing for it. Does anyone know what this is? Or am I the only really old person here? VHS. Uh, okay, so it's not a VHS, but it is a digital video. It's actually a mini digital video. Now, I'm going to say the year and scare you very much. I, was, I used this in a project I did with students back in 1998. Please do not gasp because that's 23 years ago. I, give me another 15 seconds just to get over the shock of that. Okay, so uh, I was a language teacher and uh, I was working in a Japanese university. And by the way, most of my experience is at, uh, in higher education. So for those of you in primary, secondary, you can still do something like this. I asked my students to sit in pairs and I had two cameras and they each had their own digital video cassette. They would put the cassettes in the camera, start play, and they would have a three minute conversation with each other in English. Remember these are Japanese language, so this is English as a foreign language. Um, because if you've ever been to Japan, most people even after eight years of English education have a really hard time speaking English. So my main point was to get them to improve their communicative English. Now, I was a very cruel teacher because I did this every week on Monday. And their homework for the Wednesday class was to go back, watch the entire three minute video and write a transcript of the entire video and then correct all of their grammar. And then on Wednesday, they would meet with their talking partner and go through the whole conversation and talk about what the grammar they get corrected. I did this every week for, I think, 15 weeks. So I was a really cruel teacher because that's a lot of work. But these were English majors. They were highly motivated and they really loved to do it even though it took them a lot of time. My last assignment in the last week was to have them rewind the tape all the way to, to the beginning and to watch themselves over 15 weeks and see if they could see the progress in their English, in their speaking ability, in their confidence, et cetera. And I promise you, they all loved this and they saw it very clearly, it was right there. Now at the time, I didn't know it was a growth portfolio that I was creating with them, but that's what it was and it was done on a digital tape. And when I talk about online uh, technologies, I'll give you obviously modern day solutions for that. Okay, so at this point, uh, I've talked about the three main things and I'm looking at the time, we're probably gonna run over a few minutes, not too much, and because uh, I am almost finished. But uh, I just want to see how you're doing with what we've talked about with these three types of assessments. So if you can type one for one finger that matches the statement, I don't understand anything, explain it all again, which I can't do in an hour. If you feel like you still need help, some things are easy, but others aren't, just type in two in the chat. Three, I'm getting there, but I still have some questions. Four fingers, I mostly understand, we can continue. Five fingers, I completely understand, I own it. Okay, I see a lot of fours coming through. There are some threes. I don't see any ones yet, which makes me very happy. It means I've kind of done my job. If someone can type one, then I don't need to pay Dr. Hari, isn't <laughs> it? <laughs> okay, so uh, whether you know it or not, uh, we've just done used another holistic rubric here. So here's another example of a holistic rubric. Uh, and I'll talk about this again in just a second. But you've used this rubric to assess yourself. And the first rubric was also to assess yourself. So you don't necessarily have to use rubrics. I know I'm bouncing back. For you, the teacher, to assess the student. They can assess themselves and they can assess each other. Peer assessment, which I'm going to talk about. Okay, so a quick review. We think the most important question is how do you know your students learn something? It is important, but I don't think it's as direct or as detailed as how do you get direct evidence? And this is really our main job as teachers is we want to make sure our students learned what they're supposed to learn, but we really need the direct evidence. So what I talked about today are three approaches to 
getting there. Now, you all work with administrators and they want efficiency and they're always going to say, what's the most efficient way to get this evidence? And their answer is always going to be multiple choice questions, selected response, multiple choice, true, false, fill in the blanks, short answer, not essays, they take too long, rubric assessment, forget all, forget all about that. But I promise you in the workshop, the online workshop that I will do with you will work specifically on writing multiple choice questions that are higher order questions, except for the create level. You cannot, I don't care what anyone says, you cannot write multiple choice questions where you can ask students to create something. They can analyze, they can evaluate, and they can apply in multiple choice questions. So I will do that in, a, in the uh, upcoming workshop. And I think Malavan will tell you the dates of that coming. We also talked about how to communicate your expectations. And again, I've mentioned that you can do this even as a self-assessment, you can use rubrics as self-assessment or peer assessment. And you've had a couple of examples of that today. And uh, direct evidence was my story about the digital video learned over a longer period of time. And I would highly recommend that you start thinking about gathering all of the things your students produce and deciding the type of portfolio they're going to use it with. So now I'm going to tell you my history and my life in another one minute. Uh, I see that it's exactly one hour, so it's probably gonna take me a minute or so. And then we're gonna have short questions and answers right at the end, okay? so. I did that back in, and I still can't see the dates. I did that back in 1998, I think, with digital video. And that was a growth portfolio that I used with them. Um, and then uh, that was so successful that in 2000, oh, by the way, 1998, that was a Japanese university. In 2000, I moved to another Japanese university and I really liked the digital video as this kind of portfolio type uh, you know, growth over time. So I used it in a slightly different way with project-based learning with students and they would put all their video recorded projects and watch to see the progression of their creativity, their language ability, etc. These days, of course, we have your smartphones and your smart devices and lots of different websites, including Google Sites, which I didn't include. So Vimeo and YouTube are very popular places where students can upload their videos. We know Instagram and TikTok are also very popular. And there is one technology that's fairly new called Flipgrid, which we're using at our college. I'm experimenting with it with my teachers and really kind of pushing that on them because it's a real good way for students to record themselves and for teachers to record formative or summative assessment right back at them. But it's a performance and it can be a, a scored on a rubric. And actually they do have built-in rubric system there. It's a very simple system, but Flipgrid, I would highly recommend to look into. Uh, it's actually owned by Microsoft. So um, it's a little strange how that works out, but it, it's there and it exists. Now in 2004, I returned to the US and I started teaching at a university. And my main job was not to be a teacher, but to be a teacher trainer and to teach teachers on using portfolios. And again, my screen is blocked, but hopefully you can see live text down in the lower right corner. Can you see that? Yes, okay. So we use this e-portfolio software called live text. And before I did today's talk, I checked to see if live text is still around and it is. So uh, I didn't really look into it, but we liked it because we were able to do this combination of um, showcase and uh, evaluative portfolios with the teachers, modeling them, and then they would create uh, portfolio templates for their students to do as showcase and evaluative templates. I also started working as an adjunct in another college uh, in 2007, and they had their entire Bachelor of Teaching program as a live text-based uh, portfolio. And they had the students do about 150 different tasks over all of their courses in four years they were all put into live text so that by 
the end of their four years, they had a big showcase portfolio that would get them their teaching credential to teach in the state that I worked in. And if you really want to push me, I'll tell you what state, but I'm not going to tell you right now. In 2012, I moved to Saudi Arabia to lead an English language teaching project with the largest vocational college in the country. We, and I was managing directors at 23 different sites. And I found a great piece of open source software called Mahara. And this was a portfolio software, not live text. Uh, and this was free. And I was only able to do very limited experimentation with it. Uh, but it looked good and it looked so good. I, and I was really surprised because in 2015, when I came over to Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates, the college that I'm working for now was also using Mahara, but in a very limited capacity. Because in 2019, we were told that Mahara being open source is outside of the wall, the uh, safety wall. So no more using Mahara. So we use Blackboard as our learning management system. And Blackboard does have a portfolio system. And we are now using that in our teacher training program. We train new teachers. We train new Emirati teachers that come into the college and put them through a one-term teacher training course. And all of their assignments are evaluated with rubrics and then put into the portfolio once uh, the rubric, once the assignment gets an 80% or better. So we're using this with a showcase portfolio. Three other pieces of technology that you can and should use for assessment. Number one is Nearpod. I wanted to do my presentation on Nearpod today, but uh, Malaman said no Nearpod. So, okay, I'm just doing slides and showing you slides. I use Nearpod all the time with uh, my teachers. It's extremely high, highly interactive. You can do multiple choice questions. You can do multiple select questions. You can do open-ended questions that you can have them put into some kind of rubric-based assessment or portfolio. We don't really do portfolios in my general courses. And then of course, the last two, which are uh, recreations of who wants to be a millionaire. You have Kahoot and you have quizzes. These are also multiple choice, gamified multiple choice questions. And the teachers love using these, but I have observed, and it hasn't surprised me, most teachers tend to use Kahoot and quizzes with lower order thinking, recall of information type questions. And I'm really pushing them to say, if you love Kahoot, you can use Kahoot in several different ways to teach new concepts and to gamify it, but with higher order questions. And actually over the last month, I've been doing workshops with about 350 of the 1,200 teachers that I'm working with and telling them, especially we're working on how to write higher order multiple choice questions. And I will tell them do it in Kahoot, experiment in Kahoot and see how that is. Uh, okay, so I'm over time, but here's the last question. And if you want to either say this or type it, what is something that I did not talk about that you were expecting me to talk about today? Can I hear from one or two people? I know this is short and kind of a higher order question. Okay, just because of the time, I'm just gonna cut myself and say, please do think about this. And if you have some suggestions, please send it to uh, Malavan and we're going to look over some of these things and talk more about this too, okay? And, and I am finished, but Malavan I know has a poll that he'd like to give you. So thanks for coming. Thanks for your participation. Apologies for running over by eight minutes, but actually I did have some technical problems in the beginning, so I started late. So I kind of did it in an hour. Thanks for listening, thanks for your participation. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night to those of you who are now going to sleep, if you're going to sleep. Malavan. Thanks a lot, Larry, thanks a lot. Um, thank you very much for joining. We are not done yet, don't worry. We have a quick poll just to understand, okay, what are your preferences in terms of our future uh, online workshops? Some of them have already been planned and some, the dates have not been decided yet. So I'm gonna launch the poll. Don't please choose whatever that you feel you would need help on. 
Okay. I'm just launching the poll. Are you able to see the poll? Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, brilliant. You can just choose them or you can type them on the chat. So this is the part where my company makes money. For those who have finished the poll, uh, just uh, we would like to issue certificates to all those who participated. So please type uh, the correct spelling of your name on the chat so that we can prepare the certificate and email you. Mazar, would you like to share something? Your hand is up. Uh, one person does not see the poll, by the way. Oh, okay. How? Do... Okay, what I can do is... Uh... Let me just access the chat. Can I know who was unable to see the poll? Uh, there is also another question. How are we going to be informed about future workshops? Not to worry, we are very good in that area, but <laughs> we spam people's inboxes, don't worry. Uh, probably by um, tomorrow or the day after, we should send you an email. Uh, we will send you, if you have provided the name for your certificate, we'll attach the certificate, number one. Number two, we'll also send you the recording of today's session. Uh, the third is the slides which uh, Larry used. The fourth, we'll also uh, list the pro upcoming workshops. Uh, we are starting the project uh, based learning workshop next week. That's by Dr. Said Benamar. Uh, so I'll attach the, the brochure link for that. For uh, the workshops by Dr. Larry, uh, prop we should be able to finalize by today, uh, sorry, by tomorrow. And we'll include those dates as well. Okay. Now, since there are three workshops which, you, which are going to be delivered by uh, Larry, uh, we want to see which one is uh, people are more interested in. Based on that, we can choose either its portfolio or rubric. Okay, and that's all from my end. Thank you very, very much. Uh, if you'd like to share some of your experiences, please go ahead. You can just unmute your mic and speak. If you want to uh, say anything bad about Larry, I would really love to hear that. I have some things. <laughs> about yourself? <laughs> Never. Uh, and by the way, if you would like me to observe you as an online teacher, uh, please contact Malaban and we can arrange uh, online teachers' observations. Uh, the thing that made me the happiest today, by the way, is that people from so many different countries came uh, and we're able to see things. I'm really very curious about what your situation is in your country in terms of assessment, especially how you work with your leadership. Because again, my doctorate is in ed leadership. So I'm interested to see how you talk with your leadership, what they expect and how they know the best way to, in terms of assessment, how they know the best way to get direct evidence that students have learned what they're supposed to be learning and how you might convince them that multiple choice is efficient but never a good direct way of getting evidence. So again, if you want to uh, write to Malavan, I think he'll give you my email address. You can write to me and we can arrange things about that too. Uh, would anyone like to share before we close the session? Larry may give a million dollars away. It will be a million of Balaban's dollars. <laughs> okay, okay. Monopoly. 
Monopoly money. <laughs> yes. Good, good. Uh, if nothing else, thank you very much. We really enjoyed, and we, it's very interesting that most of the participants were uh, were not from Qatar, because in, uh, we are based in Qatar, and a lot of the participants are usually from Qatar. Quite interesting, very interesting. I can I can tell you why. Because Don't tell me it's because it is coming. I no, just it, it's because I went to the Asian Final Cups hosted here in Abu Dhabi, and Qatar beat my team, Japan. And I was very unhappy to see my team lose in the finals. Oh, okay. Very good. Very you, good. When I see you, I'm going to be boxing you. <laughs> Can you share the poor results? Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Well, it would be interesting to see the answers. Game-based learning. Thank you. Okay, that's interesting. We have the next game-based learning session, I think on the 12th or the 14th of April. We just finished uh, one batch. So I can share the brochure with everyone. I'll, I'll, let me list all the programs so that you can choose what you like. And even if there are any courses that are not in our list and you'd like to learn about, just share with us. Let us know what, what are your preferences. Then we can do the best to help you. Uh, and again, uh, again, if you still have any comments or anything else you want to talk about now, I, I'm willing to stick around for as long as we need to. Yes. I think, uh, Larry, someone answered uh, your last question about what was not covered. They mentioned summative assessments. Uh, yeah, I didn't really talk about formative assessment, summative assessment, informal versus formal, spoken versus written, uh, but those will be there in details in all of these workshops because it, it is important to uh, do that. Okay. All right, we've got another question. Need ideas on how to use portfolios in math? I would, off the top of my head, Aruj, I would say, think of growth portfolios for that. And when students are working on problems, you need them to show their work. And of course, then over time, you want them to maybe give them the challenge of the week and have that in their growth portfolio. So not only do they have to solve the equations you give them, for example, they also have to show their work and what they saw and maybe write something brief and then put that in a growth portfolio so that over time they can see what they're, uh, how they're improving with not only solving the problems, but being able to communicate how they knew their answer. What I, what I tend to say with my teachers when I do multiple choice question, and here's, this is a teacher tip for online. When you give your students a question, maybe in a, um, in Nearpod, for example, you'll give them a multiple choice question and then, uh, or in uh, Kahoot, and you'll see how many people got things right. And the first thing I'll say to people is, okay, for those of you who got the right answer, did you know the answer or did you guess? Because you really don't have direct evidence if they really knew it or not. And teachers are pretty honest. And I have had teachers saying, I thought I knew, but I really guessed in the end. That's good, that's good to get that response. Because again, assessment is all about getting direct evidence. So ask them, here's a multiple choice question. Oh, you got the right answer. Did you know this answer or did you guess it? And you can follow it up as, can you explain how you came to knowing this is the right answer? So any way you can get uh, explanations or richer, deeper data, into how people are answering questions can tell you if they've learned what you want them to learn. Uh, interested in using portfolio for teaching medicine and dentistry. I, I think there's a lot of uh, approaches for that. 
again, I think I would use growth portfolios and in the same way with math, give them um, some scenario based challenges. Uh, and again, this is something that I would do in the task based workshop presenting uh, um, scenario based questions that can be answered in more details or can be answered if shaped as multiple choice. Maybe uh, uh, doing case, a series of case studies that then go into a growth portfolio where maybe after you do six case studies, you take a look at them to go back and see the progression of their thinking and their knowledge and how that's contributed to their decision-making uh, there, there's a lot of approaches to that. But over time, uh, doing in medicine and dentistry over time, I think it's important for students to see how they're progressing. So that tells me growth portfolio is, is a good approach. We still have 71 people sticking around. Well, minus two. Oh, Z forgot to tell them that we are not providing uh, breakfast or lunch. That's right. Yeah. Uh, sorry, doctor. <laughs> okay, sorry, doctor. Regarding your growth uh, portfolio, oh, yeah. oh, oh, should I say that we should have one uh, specific platform for us to gather all the portfolios? For example, I'm teaching English for my high school students, and when I'm teaching for, for example, for writing skill, okay, usually I will, uh, I will teach them according to the process they need to do the outline the draft and then they are writing um before this i always use the examination pad or based on the exercise book but because now it is online learning so i start to use certain uh, ap uh, applications like canva and then i start to use flip group also so i think that one can we use uh, we can um known as growth portfolio i think uh my answer to that is you, you don't have to limit yourself to one type of portfolio. And I would even say maybe in a writing class, you definitely want a growth portfolio as um, the, um, the teacher from Jenda uh, talked about the, that whole process and the things that she had her students record, but then also have a showcase portfolio of their best work. Mm -hmm. Uh, because both of the, both of those types of portfolios, you're going to assess on a task level. You're going to give them a piece of writing. You're going to assess that, and then you're going to put that in the portfolio. And then the next stage, and the next stage, and the next stage. Maybe you're going to have them do a mind map. That mind map goes in the growth portfolio. But then their best work it might be at the end. Okay, you're going to uh, everybody's going to give a presentation of their three best pieces of writing. And it could be their favorite piece or the one they know is technically the best or whatever. And that's going to be their mini growth, their mini um, showcase portfolio. Why not? Hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, which type of authentic assessment do you think needs more academic research? Um, Oh, sorry, authentic, yeah, authentic assessment. Well, again, I know from my college, the biggest problem to solve is how do you create valid and reliable um, summative assessments? And how do you create them in such a way that the learning outcomes are at an appropriate level of cognitive complexity because a lot of people are looking at the course syllabi and looking at the outcomes and noticing that the, the outcomes really don't line up to the right level of compl cognitive complexity that they should be. As an example, I usually say to my teachers, if you're teaching a first, and sec first or second year course, most of the outcomes should be, should be not must be, but should be at lower order thinking, but not limited to lower order. Even first year, first semester students need to start doing creative thinking. 
they need to start problem solving as soon as possible, but they'll need a lot of practice. So just sprinkle that in, but you don't want first year courses or second year courses to be heavy in problem solving. They need to learn the concepts, they need theory, and they need to practice that a lot because then in the third and fourth year, you're going to give them the challenges of project work and creating larger, uh, larger projects that are going to be evaluated in some way and that require the use of higher order thinking skills. One more question on the chat uh, yeah. from a while. Uh, I let my students reflect on what they've learned in a lesson. Is this as a tool of assessment? Uh, reflection is higher order thinking, right? It's analysis, it's evaluation, and it's creation all at once. And it's especially metacognitive, being self-aware of what they've learned. And that's a whole other... <laughs> It's a whole other workshop that we can offer on um, reflection. And I do, I do a lot of workshops on reflection with my teachers being a reflective practitioner, et cetera. So if that's a title you're interested to, that's one I would definitely work on. But yes, it's a tool of self-assessment. If you have students assessing themselves, you can learn about them. You're getting more direct evidence from them. So that's good. What's a good website for students online? Written work. Uh, a written portfolio. Any blogging site is good because they can password protect the blog and um, or you can set it up yourself with something like um, WordPress. WordPress is usually the most popular blogging software out there. So go to WordPress. I don't think it's wordpress.com. It might be wordpress.org. Uh, go there and see about how you set that up. I think Google Sites also might allow that. If you have a learning management system like Blackboard, Blackboard also has a blogging tool, although I don't really like it. Like it. There's a lot about Blackboard. No, I'm not going to start ragging on Blackboard. Blackboard is adequate at what it does. Let me just say that. Okay, Blackboard people, please do not give me a lawsuit. Please don't sue me. I'm the one who's going to be sued, Larry, not you. <laughs> oh, yes. Blackboard, you're great. You're the best tool ever. I recommend it to everybody. Are you a school administrator? Get it now. Okay, we're covered. Uh, so, Larry, we are at the end. We don't have any other questions. Okay. So, uh, let's wind up. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day. Have a safe day. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you. I'm going to lunch now because it's noon here. Most of you oh, are going yes. to sleep though, right? I'm going for breakfast. All right. Bye, bye everybody. <laughs> no, but take care. Bye. Okay. Thank you, Manavan. Hey, welcome. Bye. See you on the next one. Oh, yeah.